This tutorial is geared towards the LK150, but a lot of the information will transfer to other kinds of knitting machines. If you have a knitting machine that is new to you, welcome. Let me help you get started. In this tutorial, we're going to make a folded brim hat with a pico edge. Pretty simple, but it's a great way to learn how to use the machine and learn how to use the tools. When you learn how to knit, you don't start with a West Knits shawl. You start with a lumpy scarf, and then you make another lumpy scarf, and then you make another lumpy scarf until you get the hang of it, and you can make more complex things. That's what we're doing here. For this tutorial, you will need yarn, and we're going to talk about this more in a minute. Waist yarn that's about the same weight as your main yarn. Your knitting machine. Mine's back here. We'll set it up in a minute. The transfer tools. The weights. A measuring tape, which I might have somewhere. Hold on. Let me look. A measuring tape. You may also want a calculator because we're going to do some math. And some scissors. And mine here. Before we get started on the tutorial, I just want to take a second to say that the learning curve for machine knitting is steep. Some of the skills from hand knitting will transfer, not that you need to know how to hand knit in order to machine knit. You will make mistakes, you will drop a piece off the machine, you'll wind up with a snarled mess. That's just all part of the learning process. And machine knitting goes pretty fast, so it's not the end of the world to scrap what you're working on and start over. If you do wind up with a snarled mess, take a breath, walk away, get a cup of tea, and come back later. Yarn comes in a bunch of different formats, cakes, cones, skeins, and hanks. You only want to work with cones and cakes on the knitting machine because you need the yarn to feed very quickly and without any tangles. Cones are hard to find. I usually buy mine on the internet and I'll link to a few places to get them in the description. Cakes, you can buy at the store these days. These Karen cakes are getting more and more popular and there are a few other brands just check the label and make sure that it's the right size because these come in a few different weights. And you can always wind your own cakes. This is a yarn winder. You can find these all over the place. The little ones are fine if you only ever work with 100 gram skeins. But if you ever want to work with like the one pound value yarns, you'll want one of the big ones. This is a jumbo ball winder. It will wind a whole one pound skein. And I'll link to where to get these in the description. Your local yarn shop will also probably have a winding service that may cost a few dollars. That's a good option if you don't want to invest in the tools yet. And if you work with Hanks, you'll need to figure out how to use a Swift to wind it into cakes. And there are a bunch of tutorials about how to do that. When you do wind your cakes with the winding tool, you want to wind them twice. The first time you wind your cake will be to get it out of the skein format, but that can usually create kind of a tight cake that's not going to feed nicely. So after you've wound it the first time, you want to wind it the second time and make sure that the yarn is very loose in that cake. This is a very loose cake. The LK150 works best with yarn weights two and three. And in the US, you can find that number on the band of the skein or the cake. So look for a two or three. If you're outside of the US, I believe that translates to DK and sport weight. When it comes to fibers, you want wool or acrylic. Slippery yarns unravel very quickly and are hard to work with. Natural fibers like cotton and linen are very grippy and won't feed nicely through the machine. One last thing. No novelty yarns. This, oh, I can't even find the end. This is a novelty yarn. It's got a bunch of eyelashy, feathery things coming off of it. This is gonna get stuck in the machine and it's not going to knit nicely. Um, no homespun. <laughs> Nothing with like pom-poms on it, none of that. Leave that for hand knitting. So here's the thing, I have given you a bunch of rules you can break all of these rules, just not while you're learning. Once you're comfortable with the machine and you've made a few pieces, then you can start experimenting with thicker yarns, with thinner yarns, with natural fibers. You can try novelty yarns, but be prepared <laughs> for things to not go well. Let's talk about waist yarn. You want it to be a contrasting color to your main yarn and about the same weight. We use waist yarn when machine knitting because it's easier to add a few more rows of a different color than it is to put stitches on scrap yarn or 
try to pull stitches off onto some kind of stitch saver. Your waist yarn should be a contrasting color because usually when you're using waist yarn, it's because you want those live stitches from your main yarn later and you need to be able to see them and distinguish them from the waist yarn. Never play yarn chicken. If you get close to the end of a skein, stop at the end of a row and start a new one. If you try to play yarn chicken, you will drop half of your stitches off the bed and it's really hard to recover from that. For this next part, I need the machine. Let's get it set up. Here's my LK150. This is the machine that we're working with today. A lot of this information will transfer to other kinds of machines, not the yarn weight, because that's specific to mid-gauge machines, but the rest of it will. So this machine is new, so I know it's in good shape because I've knit with it before. But if you have acquired a secondhand machine or you've pulled your knitting machine out of storage after a long while, the sponge bar might have problems. The sponge bar is a strip of sponge that goes on top of the needles and holds them down to the bed. It tends to break down over time with heat and with age. If you can tilt your machine towards you and the needles stay in, you're probably okay. So I'm gonna tilt my machine and my needles stay in, nothing's fallen out. Or if your needles are really loose, it might need to be replaced. I have a video about how I did this with one of my brother machines and I will link to a tutorial for how to do this on the LK150. And I don't have good angles for this, but you can go watch my unboxing video for a more detailed explanation about how to set this up. The machine needs to be clamped down because there's a lot of force going back and forth and it needs to hold still. I forgot to extend the carriage rest, that's okay. This is the connector piece for the tension mouse. Clicks in. And then we put you here. And then the yarn guide goes towards the back. And then the tension wire gets folded over and clicks in. And then that goes up here. And then we want our weights, that box, cast on comb, the tools, and the row counter. Just get clicks, clicks in here. And if you're using a different knitting machine, your manual should tell you how to set it up. Clicky, clicky. All right, so we've set this up because it's time to knit our tension swatch. This is something that a lot of people ignore when they're hand knitting. And you can kind of get away with it when you're hand knitting. You can't get away with that when you're machine knitting because we have to weigh the piece down in order for the whole machine to knit. So it winds up stretched out both horizontally and vertically and you don't know what it's going to look like in the end. So we have to make tension swatches and then do the math based on the tension swatches. You want to use the exact same yarn. Even if you're working with multiple colors of the same brand and weight, you want to use the exact yarn that you're going to use with your project, the same machine that you're gonna be working on, and the tension that you're going to knit the final thing in. The edges don't need to be pretty. It needs to be big enough that you have at least a two by two square in the middle that is not impacted by the way that stockinette naturally curls. You want to make a few swatches at different tensions because you won't know what the final fabric is going to look like until after it's been blocked. And I'll walk you through how to pick a good swatch in a bit. All right, all right, let's move some cameras. The first step of this process is to, actually, the first step of this process is to take off the sweater. Um, the great irony of machine knitting is that it's almost impossible to do while wearing a sweater. The number of stitches that you need for a swatch is going to depend greatly on your machine and the yarn that you're using. I'm going to use this Karen Skinny Cake because I have it. <laughs> uh, let me find the end. Ah, we get barf. Oh, some pretty bad barf. You know what I'm gonna do? <laughs> I'm gonna deal with barf later and just get myself some clean yarn. Okay, go away barf. So we're gonna thread it through the, mesh, through the tension mass. 
And if you need a refresher on how to do this, either look at your manual or take a look at my unboxing video where I go through the setup steps. All right, we got yarn threaded. So we'll put that in the little clip and come back to it later. So the easiest way to cast on is this every other needle cast on. It's not a pretty edge, but we don't need a pretty edge for a tension swatch. First, a bit about the machine. The Needles are numbered very conveniently, starting at zero here and going up in other direction. Zero is the center of the bed. We're gonna start around zero. And this is my every other needle pusher tool. I'm going to bring every other needle out into working position. And then on the other side as well. And there we have the needles for our swatch. I've never worked with this yarn on this machine before and I don't know what tension I'm going to need. So I'm going to pick one. It's on the thinner side, so let's say about three. And there is a little dot here to show you what the tension is with this carriage. Finding the right tension is a lot of trial and error. Larger yarns need bigger numbers. Smaller yarns need smaller numbers. This is why we're going to knit a few swatches at different tensions so that we can figure out what makes the most sense in the end. So I'm gonna start with three. And I'm going to take my yarn and feed it into the carriage and then make one pass. And now every other yarn, every other needle has picked up some yarn. I'm just going to take the cast on comb and hook it into the spaces between the needles. And then there's this little clip on the side where I can put the tail in. Okay, that feels secure. And then we're going to bring the rest of the needles out into work. And knit another row. And now we're cast on and we can start knitting. Finding the right tension for a new yarn or a new machine is a lot of trial and error, but what you should do is take a guess and you'll get better at guessing as you get some more experience and then knit a few rows. And if the carriage is really hard to push, then you probably have too tight a tension and you need to pick a bigger number. So I've added one cast on comb and that's enough weight for this swatch. Finding the right amount of weight, weight is a lot of trial and error and I will tell you more about that in a minute. So we're just gonna knit. The number of rows you need to knit is going to depend on your yarn and your machine, but you can see I'm going here. And you can see after I've knit a few rows, the work is starting to pull in. This is just something that happens as it goes down because the work is stretched out by the top row of needles and it's stretched out by the bottom cast on comb. And as this pulls in, it starts to lose tension on the outer stitches. So that's what the claw weights are for. And you can just stick the claw weights into the work and it'll help with that. And knit a little further. Let's demonstrate some things about weight. So the way the knitting machine works is the needle gets pushed out and the loop gets pulled behind the latch. So we need the loops to stay about in the same plane. And if we don't have any weight, and let me take these weights off. If we don't have any weight on this at all the yarn doesn't stay in the same place. It gets pushed out with the needles. So we can't form new loops. And if I were to run the carriage over this, it would just create a snarled mess. And the same thing is gonna happen if you don't have enough weight. Like if I just have one claw weight here in the middle and I try to knit on the sides, the, the yarn is gonna get pulled up, pushed out too. And if you have too much weight, it will be difficult to move the carriage because the weight pulls down a lot and then it's hard to move the needles in and out because they get stuck. 
So I'll put my weights back on. And these are just hooks, so you can put them pretty much anywhere in a knit fabric. I'm gonna tilt it forward and then push it and then let it hang. Trying not to catch the tail. Okay, we're back in business. Okay, it's starting to pull in again, so I'm adding the claw weights to the side. All right, I'm going to call that pretty good. Now I'm going to make multiple swatches with this yarn at different tensions, and I need to mark the swatch so I remember which tension it was made at. And we usually do that with eyelets. So you'll need a transfer tool for this. This is my 1-3, but I'll only be using the one end. And we're going to use this to pull a stitch out and transfer it to the one next to it to make a hole. So I usually start on the right, and this is tension 3, so I'm going to make three eyelets. And the way to do this is hold it in your dominant hand with your thumb on top and your fingers on the bottom. You don't have to do it exactly this way, but this is what I recommend you try to start. And then if you can find a way that works better for you, that's fine. Thumb on top, fingers on the bottom. Put the tool over the hook of the needle, pull it out, and then use your other hand to pull it back in. And the loop will move over the latch and get transferred to the tool. At this stage, you're set and nothing bad is going to happen. But when you pull the tool off the needle, tilt it up a little bit so the stitch doesn't fall off. The stitch is just on the needle here. Then bring it over to the needle next to it and put it over the needle, and then tilt the tool up to transfer the stitch onto the needle. I like to put my hand against the work to keep the loop of that stitch in place, because if you don't, sometimes it winds up going rogue and causing problems. Pull the needle out a little bit and tilt the tool up and it will transfer onto that needle. And you can see now we have two loops on this needle and no loops on this other one. And we're gonna make three of these, so let me show you that again. Thumb on top, fingers on the bottom, Tool over the needle, pull out past the latch, push back in onto the tool, tilt it up, over to the next needle, hand against the work, and then tilt up the tool, and you wind up with two stitches on that needle. And I'm working at tension three, so I'm gonna make three eyelets. There we go and try to keep these needles that don't have any loops on them in the same plane as the rest of the working needles because if they wind up too far back, they won't knit at all. So these don't have any yarn on them, but in the next pass, they will pick up a new stitch. There we go, we can see that there are stitches here and these holes are gonna create eyelets. You don't want the eyelets to be right at the end of your work because it will be harder to figure out how many there are. <sighs> what are you doing? <laughs> My tension wires are getting stuck on the camera. You probably won't have this problem. I am happy with the size of my swatch. I have it marked with the tension. Now it's time to take it off the machine. There are a lot of ways to do a nice bind off on this machine, but we're not gonna do any of them um, because they are fairly tricky to learn and we're just getting started. Instead, what we're going to do is cut a long tail of our working yarn and then thread every stitch onto that long tail because that's what we'll be doing for the final hat. And it's stable enough to block this swatch in that state, so. I'm going to pull the weight off because it's easier to work with the stitches when there's no weight on the swatch. And then I'm going to cut a tail that's a little bit longer than the width of my working needles. And then grab a tapestry needle. And my machine came with one. Come here, come on. Out of the bag, out of the bag. 
Okay, that's a chunky needle. So I'm gonna pull my yarn out of the carriage and I can just pull from this end and then thread the end onto the tapestry needle like so. And then from this side, I'm just going to go through the stitch. And I'm not gonna pull these stitches off the needles yet because at this point they're secure and nothing bad is going to happen. And I want that reassurance that nothing bad is going to happen. So we're just gonna go through and thread the tapestry needle through every one of these stitches. Don't worry about it being perfect. Don't worry about it being, I don't know. This is, this is a tension swatch. This is something that we're learning. It's okay if it's not pretty and not perfect. I have every single stitch on this swatch now threaded onto the long tail of this. Now to get these stitches off the needles, I could try to pull up and get them off that way. But the easier way is to put some tension on the swatch itself by hand and then push the needles out. Come on <laughs> and pull them back in and then the, the stitches will fall off the needles. I don't have quite enough tension here. Actually, let me bring them all out. <laughs> this is what happens when you don't have enough weight. All right, they're all out. Tension, push them back in. And then go through and double check that all of your stitches are on the long tail. We can just pull this a little bit. Okay, there is our first tension swatch on the machine. I'm gonna go through and make a couple more. I like the, the way that this feels, but it's still kind of all stretched out from the weights and the machine. So I don't know what it's going to look until it's finally washed and blocked. But I'm gonna make a swatch probably at tension two and then one at tension four, and that should be enough to work with. I have my swatches. And I can already tell that one of them is not going to work. Yes, this is the one at tension two and it was difficult to work with on the machine. So it's probably too tight, but we won't know until these are blocked. You need to block these the same way you're going to work with the final piece so that we know exactly how the yarn is going to behave in that process. So if you're working with acrylic, it means putting it in the wash. If you're working with wool, it means a wool wash. If you're working with some other fiber, then you haven't been following instructions and I will not help you. Okay, let's do this. I like this color, it's a nice color. While we wait for the swatches to block, let's practice the techniques that we're going to use to make this hat. The first thing is going to be the Pico folded brim. This is where the waist yarn comes in. Here's my waist yarn. And this is the reason that the tension mast has two slots instead of just one. So I'm gonna feed this in. So remember we use waist yarn because it is easier than any kind of like provisional storage option that you would use for hand knitting. And we are just going to do the same every other needle cast on because this is not the final edge. This is just a temporary edge. I'm going to take my waist yarn and feed it into the carriage and pick a random tension because this is just practice. So it doesn't really matter. Every other needle. Cast on comb, bring everybody else out. And then I'm going to knit a few rows. Okay, this has gotten a little gnarly because I had some stitches tuck here instead of knit. And that's what happens when you don't have quite enough yarn because this yarn is a little too thick for the tension that I'm using. But again, this is the waist yarn. This is not the final thing. Doesn't matter all that much. So this is about enough waist yarn. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to cut the waist yarn. And then I'm going to start knitting the brim with my main yarn. So let's pull that out of the carriage. 
and hook that into the clip down here. And then I'm going to knit one row with my main yarn. And there we go. You can see they're contrasting colors, so you should be able to see this later. And then we're going to knit the brim at a slightly tighter tension than the rest of the hat. So I'm going to turn this down one. So right now it's at four. I'm going to put it at three. And then this will be the first row and we're going to knit five rows total for the brim. So one, two, three, four, five. And now for our pico edge, we need one row in the middle. So there's our pico edge. And this is starting to pull in, so I'm just going to add some claw weights. The way that we make the pico brim is by taking each stitch and transferring it one over to the left. So again, with the transfer tool, hold it with your fingers on the, the bottom and your thumb on the top. Pull the needle out, push it back in, lift up, and then transfer to the next needle. We're going to do this with every other stitch. And this will create eyelets all the way across the bed when we keep knitting. And when you fold that in half, it gives you that pico edge. So when you're knitting by hand, you do this stitch by stitch. But when you knit by machine, you tend to think of entire rows at once. So we're going to set up this whole row and then keep knitting. Okay, we have all of our stitches transferred. Make sure that the needles that don't have any stitches on them are in the same line as the rest of the stitches, otherwise they won't pick up a new stitch. And then we're going to knit five more rows for the outside of the brim. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so we can see we have our eyelets here. And now we're going to pick up the bottom row of stitches that we have saved on the waist yarn. So the first thing to do is take off all of the weights, including the cast on comb. And then we're going to use the transfer tool to pick up the live stitches. So you can see here pretty obviously which ones are the main yarn and which ones are the waist yarn because they used a contrasting color. So the first stitch is right here. Just gonna stick the transfer tool through it and then put it back on this, the needle. We're gonna do that all the way across. Once you get the hang of doing one stitch at a time, you can try multiple stitches. And then we get down to the ends, and they're a little harder to find. This last one's always tricky. It's like a little knot in there. Come on, come on. Eh, there we go. Got it. Okay, and then push all the needles back. So then we can see we have our little tiny hem under here. And then we are going to rehang the weights. And these are just a metal claw, so they should stick into the work to pull it down. Now let's talk about tension. We knit the brim at one tension dial tighter than what we're going to knit the body at. But for just this one row where we have all of these doubled up stitches, we're going to knit it at one tension dial higher to accommodate the extra stitch on the needle. So I'm going to turn this back to four where it was before, and then I'm going to turn it up one so it's at five. And then we'll do one stitch, one row rather. Yeesh. And it can be a bit of a struggle, but that's okay. And then we go back to our main tension, which was four. And keep knitting. And my cast arm comb fell off, so let's just rehang that. <laughs> It keeps falling off. Come on. 
Okay, that should be in there good. Let's see, that's good enough for our test piece. Now to reduce the bulk in the brim of the hat, we are going to do the same thing we did with the pico hem and transfer every other stitch over to the needle next to it. And then I'll show you how we go from there. So back with my transfer tool, we're going to transfer everybody. And this is really a two-handed process. You see, I've got my dominant hand on the tool to pull the needle out, and then I have my non-dominant hand back with the butts of the needles to pull them back in. And of course, I'm not holding the tool the way that I told you to, <laughs> because I've done this quite a bit and figured out, ah, oh, I dropped a stitch. All right, you see there's a loose stitch there. I'm just going to take my transfer tool and try to get it back. There we go. It's on the transfer tool and it's on the needle. It's mostly on the needle. Yes, it's on the needle. Um, I'm not holding the tool the way that I told you to because I have done this probably hundreds of times at this point and I know what works best for me. This is one of those do as I say, not as I do situations. What I get for not following my own advice. Also, there aren't edge weights here, so there's not quite enough weight. Let me add those. Okay, there is all of our stitches transferred. And what we're going to do is bring the empty needles out of work. We're not going to use them anymore. Instead, what we're going to do is just knit on these every other needle thing. So we're going to take the tension and turn it down to half of what it was. If you're already at one, leave it at one. You're fine there. And then knit one more row. There we go. Now we're going to take the whole thing off on a tapestry needle again. But let's pull a long tail for this. And cut it there. And then pull it out of the carriage. And it's on the left side, it's still possible to do this. Thread it on our tapestry needle. Pull all of the weights off. And then start threading through the stitches. You can do these one at a time, you can do it a few stitches at a time. Doesn't really matter. What I can't do is do it with my non-dominant hand. This is easier from the right. <laughs> as you practice and as you make more things, you'll develop muscle memory for most of this. But it'll be awkward for the first few attempts. I have all of my stitches threaded onto the long tail and now I'm going to pull them off. Remember, bring everybody out into hold. Push the stitches back past the latch and then pull them out. There we have our tiny little test hat. And you can see that's the Pico hem. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do is pull the waist yarn off of this. It's hard to unravel because of the way that we cast on. So on the opposite side of the tail, look at where your waist yarn meets your main yarn. Grab your scissors and just snip half of that loop. That'll help it unravel. And, but instead of unraveling stitch by stitch, we're gonna pull on the tail and it'll pull all of the yarn through the stitches. So we've pulled out that last row of stitches and the rest should just come off. Excellent.
except I split a stitch there, so let's just cut that. And there we go. Double check that all of your stitches are secured in that brim. Mine look good. If you don't have them all in there, that's fine. You'll just pay more attention next time. Okay, so there are two ways we can seam up our little test hat. We can either start at the bottom or we can start at the top. Um, I'm gonna start at the top because I already have this yarn threaded on a needle and it'll be easier that way. So I'm going to gather this up and actually do this inside out. Gather this down. I'm going to thread the needle through one of the stitches on the other side of the hat and then pull this in close and tight and then run a few stitches through the crown of the hat to help tighten it up. Okay, that's probably good. And then we're just gonna mattress stitch down to the brim. So if you're not a hand knitter, this might be new to you but starting one column over from the very last one, go through between the columns and pick up two bars on one side. And I got my thread wrapped around. And then go to the other side and pick up another two bars. Let's call that there. And then go back. And this is hard to see because I'm using the same color on itself. You can leave the stitches a little loose for a few, but eventually you can pull them tight. And that's how we get a seam. Okay, I've gotten down to near the brim. So we're just going to keep working on the outside of the brim. and we're going to follow it around to the inside. So if we just keep going. There, we've crossed over the bottom edge. And it's gonna look a little funky for a little while. But that's okay, it'll start to make sense when we pull it all tight. And now we're on the inside of the brim. And there's the last stitch. Okay, you can see the stitches are loose now, but when I tighten them up, there's our seam. So, we have created a tiny hat. This would not fit a human. It might fit a chihuahua or a cat. But this is just our little test hat. At this point, you should understand all the techniques that are gonna be required to make the human-sized hat. If you struggled with any of that, I encourage you to go back through the video and make a few more test hats until you're comfortable with all the techniques. Um, because the big one is just gonna be significantly larger than this, but everything else is the same. All right, I'll be back when my swatches are done. My swatches are done in the wash, so let's take a look at them. You should have made a couple at different tensions. Now is the time to figure out which tension works best. So this is gonna be tension four. And 
this one is, let me find my eyelets, tension three. So this one must be my tension two, and there are my eyelets. So the kind of fabric that you want is a lot up to personal preference. If you have a sweater that you like, you can go ahead and compare that to your swatches. Tighter tensions are going to be denser and therefore warmer. Looser tensions are going to be less dense and not as warm, but they're significantly easier to work with on the machine than the tighter tensions. A good swatch, you'll be able to see a bit of light through the knit and that's okay. This one I had trouble working with while it was on the machine because the tension was too tight. So I'm not gonna use that one. So it's between these two. Looser tensions are gonna have more drape and that's just the way that the fabric lays. This one has less drape and this one has like no drape. So I'm gonna go with the tension four because I just like this swatch better. I like the way it feels. It's not too loose and it'll be good for my hat. So now let's figure out the gauge. I'm going to measure at least a two inch area and count the number of stitches that are in that two inch area. Two, three. So we've got 11 stitches in two inches. So that's going to be 5.5 stitches per inch. And then we need the number of rows per inch. And again, we're gonna go look at two inches worth of rows. We have 16, 16 rows in two inches, so that's going to be eight rows per inch. And you'll have to do the math on your own swatch, but that's where we are here. Now it's time to do some hat math. Um, it's too hard for me to show my head at this camera angle, so let's work with a pumpkin instead. Let's say your face is about here. You are going to want to measure the circumference of your head around the biggest part. And then you're going to want to measure from the bottom of one ear over the top of your head to the bottom of the other ear. So this is my pumpkin, but let me measure my actual head. The circumference is 22 inches. And then from the bottom of one ear to the bottom of the other, that is going to be 14 inches. So now that we have our gauge information and the measurement of our head, we can start doing the hat math. So a hat is just a big rectangle. This distance here is going to be the circumference of your head. And for me, that was 22 inches. And then this distance here is going to be half of the distance from your ear to your ear. So that's seven inches. And then we're going to lose a bit of length when we gather up the crowns. So I'm going to add an inch to that. So half of 14 is seven plus one is eight. And then we'll have a one inch brim on the bottom. It's one inch. And then we have our one row for the pico hem. And then we have another inch of knitting for the inside of the brim. That's one inch. So now let's figure out how many stitches and how many rows. I'll start with the width. I'll pull up my calculator because I can't do basic math. Uh, let's see, 22 inches is the circumference of my head times 5.5 stitches per inch. And that is 121. 121 stitches. And then eight inches times eight rows per inch is going to be 64 rows. But that's not what we're knitting quite yet. These are one inch, so those are gonna be eight rows each. Then we need to figure out this distance. So it's just going to be the 64 rows minus the eight here, which will be 56. And that's all the information we need for the hat. We are going to cast on 121 stitches onto waist yarn, knit eight rows, knit one row, do our pico transfers, knit another eight rows, and then rehang our live stitches and make the folded hem. And then we're gonna knit 56 rows and do the crown shaping. And that's our hat.
Okay, so we need to cast on 121 stitches onto waist yarn. I'm gonna call it 120 because that's a little bit easier. We're gonna do the same every other needle cast on that we did for our test hat and for our gauge swatches. And the bed is numbered so you can easily count. Well, <laughs> I can't count. You might be able to. So I'm gonna thread the waist yarn into the carriage. Knit one row. Every other needle has picked up a stitch. And then this is pretty long, so I'm going to attach the cast on combs together. Mine came with these little metal pieces that slide into the edge. Then I can just fit them together. Looks like two is not quite enough, so I'll add in the third. This makes one giant cast on comb. There we go. And then bring the rest of the needles out to work. And knit. I'm gonna go slow the first few rows because this is a big piece and I don't know if it has enough weight on it yet. Pretty good. Okay, that's enough waste yarn for now. So I'm going to cut the waste yarn and then thread in my main yarn. Clip that out of the way. And then main yarn. Eh. I'm going to knit one row at my main tension. And then I completely forgot to talk about the row counter. It's right here. Some of these have a reset button. This one does not. You can just turn the dials. And we know we need eight rows for the inside of the brim. So I'm going to reset this. I would have set it to zero, but I already knit one row. So I'm going to set it to one. And then because this is the brim, we knit it at a slightly tighter tension. I'm working at tension four, so I'm going to move it down to three. And then I'm going to knit until this hits eight. All right, that's eight stitches for the inside of the brim. And then we need to knit the one row that'll be the pico hem. So let me do that. If you remember from the test hat, we need to take every other stitch and transfer it over one to create the eyelets for the pico hem. Reminder, thumb on top, fingers on the bottom, hold the tool parallel to the bed of the knitting machine, and then put it over the stitch, pull it out, push it back in with your other hand, lift it up slightly at an angle, and then move it over one stitch and tilt the tool up to put it on the stitch, keeping one hand against the fabric. And that's it. This is really a two-handed process. Make sure that the needles wind up all in the same line. Okay. There is our Pico hem. Now we're gonna keep knitting, but first I'm gonna reset the row counter because we know we need eight more rows. And this is starting to pull in, so I will add claw weights to the edges. Okay. That first row can be a little difficult. That's it for our hem. Now we need to pick up the live stitches from the waist yarn and put them back on the needles. Take off all of the weights, including the cast on comb. And then we can use the transfer tool 
to grab these stitches and put them back on the needles. So you can pick up the stitches one by one. But once you get the hang of it, it's easier to do a few at once. It goes a lot faster. We've got all the stitches back on the needles and push your needles back so they're all in line. I'm gonna reset the row counter to zero. Rehang our weight. Try not to get the tail end caught. Stick it in there, good. And then we're going to knit this one row because we have extra loops on the needles. We're gonna knit it at one tension higher than what we are knitting the body of the hat in. I'm knitting the body of the hat at tension four, so I'm gonna turn it up to five just for this one row. And this might be a bit of a struggle. There we go. And my cast on comb is falling out. And then we're just gonna knit. From my pattern, I know I need 56 rows. So I'm gonna go until the row counter says 56. But first I'm gonna turn the tension back down to four, which is what I swatched at. The piece is starting to pull in at the side, so I'm going to add claw weights. The claw weights need to be moved up periodically. And there we are at the end. That's the whole hat knit. Now to decrease the bulk in the brim when we gather it up, we need to take every other stitch and move it over one, the same way we did for the Pico hem. Okay, we have every other stitch transferred over. And now instead of trying to make sure that these empty needles are in the right place to pick up new yarn, we're gonna push them out of work because we don't need them anymore. And then we're going to turn our tension down to half of what it is now. I'm at tension four, so I'm gonna to go to tension two. If you're already at one or close to the bottom, you can leave it where it is. And then knit one more row. And we're done with the knitting. We're gonna take this all off onto a long tail now. Let's cut that long tail. Make sure it's at least as long as the bed and a little bit longer because I wanna use it to sew up the side seam as well. So there that goes. We wrap it around the thingy and then we pull it out of the carriage. And now we're gonna pull all the weights off, including the cast on comb, which is gonna go behind me in the box. Feed a long tail onto the tapestry needle. And then go stitch by stitch and pick up the stitches onto the needle. So I am doing these about two at a time. I stick the tapestry needle through the first one, and then I stick it through the second one, and then pull the whole thing through. All right, I have all of my stitches loaded onto the long tail. Now we can pull it off the machine. So I'm gonna bring all of these needles all the way forward so that the loops are past the latch. And then push all of them back. And there we have our hat. It's just a big rectangle and it's a little stretched out because it's been 
stretch out by the machine. So let's give it a good tug to help set the stitches. And then we're going to remove the waist yarn the same way on the side opposite from the tail. And this is the tail of the waist yarn. We're going to find the last stitch and cut one leg of it and then pull on the long tail that's attached to the main yarn. And this takes a bit of effort on a piece this big, but it is doable. There it comes. And we have our yarn out, and then this will just pull away. And there we go. I'm going to gather up the crown of this hat the same way I did before, by pulling in on the gathering stitch, and then thread my long tail through part of the other side. Pull it tight and then flip it to the inside. This is a little bigger than our tiny test hat. And I'm just going to take a few stitches through the center, making sure to catch a bit of both sides. This will help tighten up the crown of the hat and keep your head from getting cold. Do this like four or five times. Okay. And now we can start seaming down the side. So going to go one column in from the very, very edge and pick up two bars and then do the same thing on the other side. And I will show this to you when it's at a part of the color variation that is easier to see because I know dark stuff doesn't show up well on camera. Okay, we've reached a lighter section of the hat. You can see I'm going in, this is the very, very edge. I'm going in one row from the very, very edge, one column from the very, very edge, picking up two bars and then doing the same thing on the other side. It just goes like that all the way down the side of the hat. And then pull tight to finish the seam. You can see it's pretty seamless. Okay, we've gotten down to where the folded brim is and this part can be a little tricky. So let me show you how to do this. You're gonna keep going with the outside of the brim the way you have been going, so. Unless your yarn gets tangled. So pick up two bars from each side and try not to get stuck in the folded over row. And then we're just gonna keep going. And you might get a little lost when you get to the pico hem, but just do your best. This part's not going to be very visible, so if it's not the best, it's okay. And then keep your stitches loose. We can tighten them up later, but we are going to turn the corner over the edge and keep going. Is that the stitch that I want? No, I want like next to that. And this is going to want to naturally roll in, so kind of pull it out. And you can fudge this a little bit, <laughs> like I'm doing here. Let's see, pick up two bars there. And I think I'm off a little bit, but that's okay. Pick up two bars there. And at this point, I'm going to pull this tight so it's easier to round the corner. Come on. You can do it. There we go, that's a tight seat. And then we just keep going down the inside of the brim. 
assuming I can get my fingers to work correctly. <laughs> The one seam on this hat is done. At this point, it's time to wash and block this hat. So whatever you did with the gauge swatch, you want to do with the final hat, and it will be in its final configuration. Here we are at the end of this video. I hope that you have learned something from this and I encourage you to practice and make as many hats as you need to make until you're comfortable with all the techniques. The folded brim, the pico hem, the transfer tools, figuring out how much weight you need, swatching, it will all help you with your next bigger project. I did an unboxing of the LK150 and I made this beginner beginner tutorial because it's part of this larger plan to create more machine knitters. So I want to hear from y'all who are new to this or maybe not so new to this. What else do you want to see? What techniques do you want to learn? What kind of projects do you want to see on this basic beginner machine? And I will see what I can do to help you get started. No, but really, make as many hats as you need to make. Maybe all of your friends and family are getting hats for the holidays this year. There are also a bunch of charities that need warm clothing when it's winter, so check those out. That's about it. Thanks for watching. Happy knitting. It's dark now, and I started in the morning. Um, don't take that as an indication of how long it takes to make a hat. It took me about an hour to make a hat, and that was because I was filming in the process, and filming always makes everything take twice as long. The filming is what takes forever.